Okay, uh, well, uh, this is another episode of the podcast, and uh, I guess today is Sam. Ah. <laughs> uh, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, no, thanks for asking me. I finally feel validated. <laughs> so, uh, perhaps for people who don't know you on uh, your Instagram or anything. Uh, yeah. Uh, could you give us a background of your training? Or? Okay, so um, I have been living in Okinawa for six years. But this is my fourth time talking now, so it's the longest time I've stayed here. How I got into karate was basically my parents just opened the yellow pages and located the closest dojo, or a dojo that had like a special on. They didn't know anything about like styles or like a mech dojo and a real dojo. So I was kind of pretty lucky that I ended up in a Okinawa Gojiru um, dojo that also taught Yuku Kobudo. And my sensei, his name is uh, Henny de Fries, and he uh, is from Namibia, but moved to Australia. But he had lived in Okinawa for, I think, maybe a, a year or two, and had trained under um, Higawana Morio Sensei, and under Akemine Eisuke Sensei for Ryuki Kobudo, and for Okinawa Gojiryu. And then after training with Higawana Sensei for a while, he moved to an Uhara Ko Sensei's dojo, and he's still a student of that dojo, even though... Um, well, Hara Sensei has passed on. And he recently changed from the Shinbukan Dojo, uh, Akimine Hiroshi Sensei's Dojo, to uh, what's his name? Kuniyoshi Sensei's Dojo. I don't know the name of that organization. But um, I trained Goji Do there since I was maybe 12 years old. And then I came to Okinawa when I was 20 to, to live. And after coming to Okinawa, I did Goji Do for a little bit. But then I, I stopped because um, kind of some like problems with my Ryukyu Kobodo Dojo. I decided to stop training at the dojo of Akimine Hiroshi Sensei's dojo and move to another dojo, the dojo of uh, Kinjo Masakazu Sensei of the Ryukyu Kobodo Hozonkai. And then I thought since that I had moved to you know, the Hozonkai and that Kinjo Sensei's style is Uechiru, it may be practical for me to stop training Gojiryu and start Uechiryu. And that's been on like the to-do list for the past four years and I've never started but I've just trained consistently in Ryukyu Kobudo. So um, we were talking uh, before uh, the podcast started about your first trip to uh, Okinawa when you were 16, that was kind of an yeah. interesting story. So <clears throat> when I was 16, I did an exchange, like my high school offered an exchange to Japan. And uh, we went to uh, Hyogo Prefecture, but afterwards I had the option to come to Okinawa for two weeks. And at 16, like, I just was the kind of person that you, you couldn't tell me no, I just would do what I wanted. So I came to Okinawa for two weeks and Henny Sensei set me up with Akimine Hiroshi Sensei. And I lived in that dojo for the two weeks that I was here. And while I was here, I asked Akimine Sensei um, if he would introduce me to a Gojiru dojo. And he sent me to, um, I think, three in total. One of them being Uoharako Sensei's dojo, which Henny had trained at. And Uohara Sensei, he, he's kind of like, he's, he's a character. Kind of hard to explain. He's very strict and very set in his ideas. But I think he's like one of those like mad geniuses. But at 16, you don't you don't understand like the opportunity that you've been given. So kind of went there and it was usually too hard for me because he didn't have many students. He was the kind of dojo that would have like three main students at a time and they were, you know, black belts, uh, had practiced way longer than me, were more like serious about training than I was when I was 16. So that was kind of like a wasted opportunity, but when I came back to Okinawa, I did go back to his dojo, and then I started learning a lot about like makiwara because he kind of likes to design these makiwaras by himself. He would draw like designs of makiwara on the floor in chalk, and then later build them. So he had like a lot of bow makiwara. He had makiwara for sai, but. Again, I think I was like 17 or 18 by the time that I came back to Okinawa the second time. And still I didn't appreciate the opportunity that I had. I think if I had really stuck out at that dojo, I would be a lot more talented in Gojiru than I am now. But Uhara Sensei is kind of the guy, kind of like 
like the type of person to really follow his own path and his own methodology and he was really interested in um, Chinese martial arts um, Kung Fu I think mm -hmm. um, so his Goju doesn't look like the stuff that you see in like the Jindokan or like in Higoana Sensei's dojo or even like the Yagi line of Goju it looks very Chinese influenced so maybe to like the uninitiated someone would say that's not Goju but I don't think that means it's not worth learning and I really wish that at 16, 17, even 20 I had understood that that was like a really unique experience to learn from because now that he's passed on a lot of that knowledge I think is just gonna disappear. Do you know what kind of Kung Fu he was uh, dabbling in? Um, I don't know the style but there is a sensei in Okinawa maybe you know him Miyahira sensei? Oh okay I've heard of him but yeah. I've not met him. <laughs> yeah so whatever he was doing um, was what kind of influenced Uohara sensei. They had some sort of uh, <coughs> excuse me uh, some sort of Kenkyukai or something like that like a research organization? I think so They yes. get together and to train? Yes and so if you like type in Uohara sensei's name into like uh, I think YouTube and there's also like a Facebook page that often reposts his stuff you'll see like a Kenkyukai like a study group of people who came from like the Miyazato, Ezo, uh, Miyazato sensei's line and then mixing with Kung Fu so you'll see like a lot of old footage of like Kyukao Masanari sensei um, Shichinohe sensei from Kyokushin used to train there for a bit as well I think he's still trained up until Uohara sensei's like mm. dying moment I guess and then yeah quite a few familiar faces if you look back on that footage they're all like huddled in the corner of the dojo doing this kung fu and gojidu exchange so how did you uh, find the uh, transition from gojidu to training in weichidu so I haven't fully transitioned uh, <laughs> like do you just dabble in weichidu or well I dabble in it yeah and because Kinjo Sensei is Uechiryu, I've noticed that he's changed up a lot of my stances and kind of the way that I think about stepping in particular. Um, so basically, I think I've been influenced by all three styles of karate. Because Akimine Hiroshi Sensei comes from a shorter new style. Mm -hmm. So his kobudo, I think, kind of reflects that, especially with things like Shizendachi and Ahaya Shikodachi. Um, and then in Gojiru, you know, our Shijindachi looks a lot different and our Sanchindachi and the way that we step is also very different. So even when I was with Akimina sensei I noticed that there was like a clash of like my Gojiru basics and then what he was now teaching me that was shorter new influenced. And then when I left um, Akimina sensei's dojo and then went to Kinja sensei's dojo, it was kind of going a little bit more back to the Gojiru roots because I think the way to do is a little bit more closely tied into Gojiru, so the, the Shikudachi was still a lot lower. So I think then it was kind of more of an easy transition, but since Akimina Sensei had taught me a lot about moving in Shizendachi in shorter new style, I kind of had to like delete what he had taught me and then reset it with something new. And uh, the, the Kobudo is from the same lineage, but same they, lineage. they look a little bit different to my eye. Yes, so I know Akimine Hiroshi Sensei's father, Akimine Esuke Sensei, was a direct student of Taira Shinken, and um, Hiroshi Sensei, I also think, trained with Shinken Sensei a, a little bit. He was mostly doing um, karate, I think, with Higa, Higa Yuchoku Sensei, not exactly sure of the names, but uh, my current sensei, Masukazu Kinjo Sensei, uh, he was a student of Minowa Sensei. And Minowa Sensei was a student of um, Taira Shinken Sensei. So the kind of the split came a little bit like earlier on in the history of Ryukyu Kobudo. And uh, this is kind of like a legend. I'm not sure if it's true or not. Taira Shinken used to train people on different days and he wouldn't exactly teach everything the same way. So if like if you were doing this dance a certain way, he wouldn't exactly correct you. And so if you had like the person training on Monday and the person training on Tuesday, they're both learning from the same teacher, but apparently they were allowed to have like a little bit of uniqueness to the, their cutter and such. So now since they told me that uh, he'd learned um, some bow cutter from him, and he said that uh, he basically 
flavored it to your karate system. Like yeah. You, you wouldn't change too much of your fundamentals. Yeah. So I think that's kind of where where the main split comes from. Also, Kinjo Sensei is kind of like a researcher. So um, I think he's interested in always finding an application for things. And if something in the kata doesn't really have an application, I think he will kind of maybe change it a little bit to serve that application. I'm not sure if that is a Minoa Sensei influence or like coming directly from Kinjo Sensei. But something I do really like about my dojo is that if I go, why do we do it this way? He usually has an answer. So that is something. That's I, kind of unusual for it being, the name is a preservation society. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think, I think like words and like titles like that, they're kind of hard because, well, you, you don't use kobudo in your everyday life. I'm sorry to offend anyone out there, but I don't go down a dark alleyway, alleyway and then whip out a sigh. Like that's just not something that happens. <laughs> it does in like my fantasy world where I'm going to be the next Ninja Turtle, but with preservation, maybe they're preserving the, you know, the practical things. But how can it be practical if it's not something that gets used? So it's kind of just like in theory, this practically works kind of thing. I thought it, I always thought of uh, Rukio Kobodo Hosen Shinko Kai as a sort of like cultural preservation rather than like yeah. A, I did, but I could see like uh, maybe trying to preserve practical things, but yeah, it's kind of difficult because sometimes even with me, I'm like karate is kind of a little bit more practical than kobudo. Some people don't like you to split karate and kobudo up; they see it as the same thing. But with kobudo, as I said, you don't carry a bow around with you every day, and the chances of you getting attacked and having something in the exact shape of the weapon that you've been practicing with, I think is like slim to nothing. And some people say you can take the um, principles of Kobudo and then maybe apply it to everyday objects. But at the same time, like, mm, I don't really, <laughs> it doesn't make that much sense to me. I just do Kobudo because I think it's fun. I think it is a preservation of culture. It's, uh, it's a good way to exercise and I noticed that you can come from doing karate to, to doing kobudo and you'll feel like a fish out of water but you can you can go from doing kobudo to karate and not feel like a fish out of water I did uh, Rikyo Kobudo in uh, Canada but I've never done it here actually yeah. <laughs> I just didn't never I just never had the time I felt yeah. <clears throat> it was always something I sort of added on to training and yeah and so I the think, drop it was easy yeah. for me I think that's the attitude of most people who like dabble in Kobudo. Like we'll have like groups of visitors and they've been training at this one particular dojo in Karate. They go there every day. And then as a bonus thing, they do two hours with us and then we never see them again. So I think people usually like just to like sprinkle it onto their training. So I think I come from like a unique position where it is mainly what I do. Oh. I was actually a, uh at uh, Akamine Sensei's uh, funeral, I went to it when I first arrived. Uh -huh. He just had died uh, maybe a week or two before I arrived. Yeah. And I had to show up at the funeral oh. and give him some money and uh, eat some uh, Okinawan food. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so let's uh, maybe move uh, into. Uh, do you want to talk about. Uh, Karate and social media? Or? Uh, yeah, so I have an Instagram account. It's called Sam underscore Champuru. Champuru being the Okinawan food. It's very similar to my surname. So I thought it was kind of like a funny thing. And because Champuru meaning like, you know, a mix of stuff. It's a bunch of stuff that I've been putting there. And it's been funny because I've had this account for years before like the Instagram star phenomenon phenomena I don't even know how to say that word the Instagram you know star became like a, a regular thing and I just noticed that nowadays rather than it being about training and then you know being authentic to 
like who you actually are as like a kobodoka or a karateka. It's now about putting your best foot forward. You're an expert in everything. There is nothing that you are bad at and you have so much wisdom to give. And then I look at these accounts and I'm like, I wonder how old this person is. And I'm like, I'm six years older than this person. And that they're giving me advice and I don't feel I'm 28. I don't feel like I have any advice to give at this age and at this I'm still in the beginning, I think, of my training period. I've been doing kobodo for, like, what, 10 years? And I still feel like any advice that I give out is just rubbish compared to someone else who's been doing it longer and better than me. And just with the whole Instagram and now YouTube, and I think Facebook as well, I'm not exactly sure about Facebook, it's just, we call it, like, the internet warrior, you know? Or the, <laughs> it's the extension of the kushi you know, yeah. yeah, and it's been really interested in living in Okinawa for six years because there have been many times where I've been written out of the story. There has been times where visitors have come to the dojo, and um, they'll find a way to not have me in the picture because oh. they want to be the only foreigner. Does it happen to you? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, they want to be the only foreigner in the dojo. Or they'll post something, like when I used to have Facebook, they'll, they'll write a status about what the training was like. And I'll be like, I don't remember that happening. Or there was one blog where the teacher said that he had a, uh, sorry, the, the writer said he had a conversation with the sensei of that dojo. And I was like, that wasn't a conversation with that sensei, that was a conversation with me. <laughs> I'm not the sensei of that dojo. Also, the other thing of just, if you've ever been to a seminar, um, I think most seminars now, it's like they have like four courts and you rotate between them. I think those are just basically a photograph, photograph opportunity. You just take, you, you do like one hour with this sensor, you take a picture and then you go through the courts and you do that like every day for a week. And collect your yeah. certificate of completion at the yeah. end of it. And and then, you know, you upload that to social media and you have that certificate and to like someone who's not well informed, that means you got a grade or something. And if you take a picture with this sensei, you're that sensei's best friend and their favorite student. And it's just so weird to see people shuffle in and out of Okinawa, take all these bits of evidence, which are just false and not be able to like really say anything because what am I going to do right on Facebook I saw you take that picture with the sensei and you're not really friends with him <laughs> like what am I going to do sounds kind of negative yeah so do you have any advice for people trying to see their way through it and to find someone who's like qualified and so it's kind of hard because um, my sensei's son said something that has really resonated with me if someone is legit you're probably never going to find out about them. Kind of like, what is it called? The, the kakishiturubushi? This the secret mm -hmm. sensei. And a lot of senseis that... Um, I'm not saying that people who are famous don't have talent. There are a lot of people who are like now famous and now get, um, you know, the uh, kind of validated, I guess, by being always um, asked to come to seminars and do this and that. But there are some senseis that don't exist on any form of social media and have a bunch of knowledge that isn't going to get shared because they choose not to have a big dojo and they choose not to share it with a lot of people. And to find those people I think is very very difficult. I think the only way you would be able to do that is if you came to Okinawa and um, you built up rapport with a certain sensei like I have with Kinjo sensei and then he introduces you to this person who has this very really unique skill so I think my advice would be to stick it out in the long run and be prepared to put a lot of time into finding those kinds of people mm, kind of a hard question to, <laughs> to answer well let's maybe take a look at it the other way and how can you avoid those like uh, snake oil salesmen uh, back home. Yeah, so one advice I have is just because you see one person on social media all the time, when I say social media, I mean like YouTube or Google or something like that. Some people have become well known 
just because they were the they were the only people that were searchable on the internet. Mm -hmm. And for people outside of Okinawa, that's basically the way you get your information from the internet. And because they were the ones back in the day that were out there, they've just been recycled over and over and over. So if you really want to train with that person, like go to their dojo, watch a class, and then maybe go to another couple of other dojos and watch those classes. Obviously don't do the naughty thing of like training at like 10 different dojos at once. I think everyone is welcome to come and look. But another thing that I kind of do I go to the dojo and even though the sensei might be very talented, I look at like the senior students and I'm, I'm like, if the sensei is at this level, what level are they at? Because I think that's also reflective of what you can potentially learn from that sensei. Because teaching and practicing are different skills. Yeah, than... very different. And if you think that like the students are at a level that you really want to aspire to, maybe that's going to be a good dojo for you. If you look at the students and they're not like, they're not at the level that you want to be at, maybe stay away from that dojo. Hmm. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, because of what I said was so insightful. <laughs> mm. No, it's good, good. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was going to ask about. I'll, I'll edit that part out. Don't okay. worry. <laughs> so, uh, so you've been here for a long time now. Yeah. <clears throat> um, like if you were to choose a teacher back home, how long would you want them to have trained in Okinawa to claim that they're actually <clears throat> an Okinawan practitioner? Okay, so a lot of people claim to be like, I trained in Okinawa and then I'll go like research their history and they were here for a seminar or they were here for like two weeks, 5,000 years ago. Not 5,000 years ago, that's going to be pretty impressive, but... Um, I would want someone who had at least lived here for more than a year. I know that I think back in the day that would have been kind of like a difficult thing to do with the whole visa thing, but I really appreciate if a sensei comes back to Okinawa maybe once a year or once every two years to kind of um, fix their mistakes or to um, build upon their knowledge and like fill in all the blanks of um, not what they left behind, but you know, when you go back to your home country, you're so far away from the source that you start to forget things. So coming back to Okinawa, um, every once in a while, I think is a good marker of someone who is legit. Also, I noticed that there are some like, um, practitioners overseas who did live in Okinawa and did train for a long time under a sensei, but that sensei has now died. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of like, I don't want to be like mean or anything like that, but that means that you can never ever check back with what is Okinawan mm -hmm. unless you come back and you find another sensei or if they had a senior in the dojo or if there was someone else who was training under the same sensei. So just because they're Okinawan doesn't mean they have a current link to an Okinawan dojo. I'm kind of on the fence about the because I'm getting older and my teachers are getting older and uh, yeah. I'm like, well, who am I going to train with? Yeah. So. yeah. That's also huge advice that I have for someone who comes to Okinawa. Figure out who's going to inherit the dojo after the sensei um, passes on and if you actually want to be their student in the future. Because there have been times where I've um, seen some dojos, not even just the ones that I'm part of, and, I'm, and I, I wonder about their future and if it's going to go in a path that I would like to follow. I've seen in groups of people who have, have lost their uh, teacher and it actually gives them sort of a freedom to, to move around a bit, yeah. which is, uh, I always kind of envied a little bit yeah. that they could move around so freely between dojos afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I actually had um, a friend with kind of like a similar experience. He, um, this friend trained with one certain sensei waiting for that sensei t to die because he, they didn't want to like seem unloyal by going to another dojo, but they just knew that that wasn't like a, um, a future that, that, that they'd be able to preserve. I always, uh, the problem with Okinawan teachers is that uh, generally the, the skill level I find is quite high mm. 
and people tend to latch on to the first person that they come in contact with because Okinawan people are quite friendly as well. Yeah. So they don't really look around as much as I think they should. Yeah. And that's something that I think I kind of, not regret, I don't have a word for it, but I came to Okinawa when I was 16, I was introduced to these dojos and I didn't question anything other than that. I was like, okay, I'm happy here. And then, you know, I, I did eventually end up changing dojos. And I wish rather than, not that I regret changing dojos, I just wish that I had never inconvenienced the dojo that I left. And that's where, like, researching what kind of place you want to be at, I think, comes into, like, great importance. I was completely lucky. I just sort of lucked into my teachers. Yeah. I was like, well, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's the thing that also I kind of, think's kind of funny when I meet um, karateka. Um, they'll be like, they'll see their sensei as like a father figure, and some dojos even kind of look like cults to me. And they think that their sensei, sensei is the bee's knees, the best thing since sliced bread. And I'm like, oh, how did you, how did you meet them? And it's always by chance, and it's usually the first sensei they've ever met. Mm -hmm. And to me, I'm just like, how do you know that that's the sensei that is best for you if you never shopped around? And when I say shop around, I don't mean like, you know, jump around dojos like the naughty people do. But if you haven't compared it to anything, how do you know that that was the best choice for you? Yeah, lots of people are always claiming that their teacher is the best. And I'm like, of course you think that, otherwise you wouldn't be with them. Yeah. And I'm the same way, I think. Yeah. The people I've chosen are the best ones. Yeah. Best ones for me, anyways. Yeah, and I think I'm, I'm in a really good place now with the dojo that I'm at. I feel very comfortable being there and I feel like really positive about training there. But as I said before, um, I was at a dojo that didn't suit me and I feel really guilty now that I, I, I left that dojo. And it's not a reflection on that sensei at all. It's just... I didn't suit that dojo, that dojo didn't suit me, and I eventually had to leave. How long did it uh, take you before you realized that uh, that uh, it wasn't quite the right fit for you? Okay, so um, I was I trained there for a year um, after I moved to Okinawa at 20, and then throughout that year I just noticed that I was very unmotivated to train, I, like, it wasn't like something wow I have training this week or training this day yay it wasn't like that but I didn't think anything of it until maybe a year later I met Kinjo Sensei and then I just kind of wondered like if he's the same style like he does it look the same and I googled um, his sons his sons um, were former champions and still champions of uh, Ryukyu Kobudo in Okinawa and I was like blown a bit away with what I saw and I was like wow I really wish that I could do that and then I didn't think anything of it but it started like gnawing at me of like if you want to be like that but you're training this there's going to be no connection <laughs> and I think maybe another six months later that like kind of sense that I had inside me that I, I wanted to be like this but I wasn't doing that started eating at me a bit more and then I went to Kinjo Sensei's dojo to like look at training and I loved what I saw and I wanted to move but I didn't want to inconvenience my previous dojo that sensei was so good to me and I still feel so like guilty and bad that I left him but at the same time I couldn't stop having this like oh, I want to be at that dojo kind of thing and I think it took me at least a year of like fighting back and forth of no, this sensei was so good to me and he's, he's actually really talented I should just stay here, but I want to be here and I, that came back and forth for a year and it took me more than a year I think to, to eventually leave and how, and you've been at the current dojo for yeah. seven years now? Or? Uh, no, for four four, okay yeah. four or three and a half I've been to, I've watched Kinjo Sensei's training maybe two or three times and uh, they always had a good amount of sweat happening. So. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're not watching me train. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so what uh, what other advice would you have for someone who's thinking about coming to Okinawa to... Uh, to live? Yeah, to live and train. And okay. And this is not said to attack anyone. You don't need a middleman to come to Okinawa, okay? If you want to come to Okinawa, there are many ways to do it. Um, so one of the best ways is if you're young and you're in a country like Australia or Canada, working holiday visa. I think you have to be under the age of 30 to, to use that. That's all I can. Yeah. So if you are under the age of 30, check to see if you have a working holiday visa option available to you. If not, if you have a degree, you can probably join something like the JET program or even come as an independent English teacher. The JET program might send you to somewhere other than Okinawa. But um, that's another way to find a job in Okinawa. I should mention, to live in Okinawa, you need a visa. So if you want to stay here long term, you're probably going to want to come on a working visa and you'll need a degree for that. Um, you can also come as a what's it called, the cultural visa, mm -hmm. but you would probably need a connection in Okinawa before you came, someone who would um, kind of vouch for you and sponsor your visa for I think six to one, six months to a year. Yeah, yeah. you need Hoshon in for, yeah. for that. I think one of my friends came <clears throat> on a, he started, stayed on a cultural visa for his first year. Yeah, so basically just find out about your um, your um, visa options and that's stuff that you can easily find on the internet. A lot of people offer programs but on those programs you have to provide your own visa. So why do you need to be on that program and if they don't give you a visa? <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that's not if you are someone who has no connection to Okinawa and you want someone to like introduce you to a bunch of places and help you out then yeah maybe finding a program like that will be really helpful but my personal philosophy is if you don't need a middleman don't have a middleman don't let anyone control whether or not you get what you want is basically what I'm saying even if you just came over three months, I think you can stay in Japan for 90 days at a time. You came over for three months, you built rapport with a certain sensei, and then if you ever wanted to come back, they might be able to sponsor your six months to a year long visa as a cultural visa. And you can work. You have to apply separately for it, but yes. you can work on the cultural yes, visa. Yes, you can. You can work. I think uh, there's a guy at my dojo currently called Arjun from India. Great, great guy. He's on a cultural visa and he recently got permission to work, I think, 20 hours a week. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. Um, also, coming to Okinawa is the first time. There are many people who can introduce you to dojos. I think people have this kind of like idea that you need someone to write you a letter. And maybe that's the case for like back in the day, but I never had to do that myself. But just find someone who does karate in Okinawa and that's easily done just go on Instagram or um, there's a lot of forums and say does anyone know someone who trains this style in Okinawa someone will connect you with their dojo and you can go look at that dojo and it's not for you you don't have to join up but you could probably even just say to that sensei are there any other dojo in this area that I can see and they're they're probably happy to call another sensei who's a friend of theirs and send you to that dojo to come have a little bit of a look. And now with like the Karate do Kaikan, you can get um, information there easily. I think you just fill out a form online to get an introduction to a dojo. And there's obviously the, the dojo bar in Naha where you can get um, James to, to uh, show you around, I think. Mm. <laughs> yeah. There's so many dojos everywhere. Yeah. You, you can, can walk yeah. around and randomly bump into mm -hmm. a dojo. So, like... <laughs> what was the uh, last count? It was uh, 300 or something? Really? I thought it was more. Oh, probably. Yeah. Okay, so when I used to work at the dojo bar, I think I was telling people 550. Not sure if that's a, that's a good number to be saying, but... <laughs> Onaga Yoshimitsu sensei used to tell me that there's more dojos than barbershops. Probably. <laughs> And I think a lot of those dojos are those little mini ones that I'm, I'm talking about that only have like three full-time students. Yeah, yeah. Just people teaching in their spare room or yeah. something. Yeah. And the Karate Kaikon, I think, is in 
a good new re resource for people. Yeah, I think that's a very, that's like just a treasure trove. And obviously I think Miguel is the one who does most of the introductions at the Kite Gun and he's been here I think 25 years. Mm, longer than me, yeah. Yeah, so I think he's pretty much everyone's like a senpai when it comes to, you know, knowing the karate culture and kobudo culture in Okinawa. I'm hoping to have him on, but I haven't asked him yet. <laughs> Miguel, he's like, he's like the person who has like taught me the ways of living in Okinawa. That's also advice that I have for someone who wanted to come to Okinawa. Make the right kind of friends. Like, make friends with people who will, you know, help you assimilate into the culture. Be like really upfront with you because there have been times where. I've had conversations with Miguel and I'm like, I'm thinking about doing this and he's gone, no, don't do that. <laughs> and then there've been times where I've been like, I'm thinking about doing this and he'll be like, okay, I'm going to connect you with the correct people. Someone like that is so valuable yeah. because that's how you don't buy the snake oil sensei, you know? There's been many times people have asked me to do something and I just flat out refuse. I'm like, I'm not doing that because yeah. that's not going to go over well. <laughs> And other times I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll talk mm -hmm. to that person for you or something. But yeah. <clears throat> people from outside the culture don't really understand like yeah. how delicate it can be. Yes. Oh, and sometimes you run into like really unfavorable situations. Or like they're kind of like so awkward that it's kind of funny that I'm laughing inside. <laughs> There'll be like two two senseis that hate each other. And then one of the students will come up and be like, Hi so and so, I train with so and so. And then in your head, you're like, oh, this is just a train wreck now because you're watching someone be like, good for you, <laughs> fuck off, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Or like knowing a certain sensei's personality and the kind of person that they don't like to talk to and that kind of person immediately coming up to them and doing all the things, you know, that sensei hates. It's just, it's kind of funny. To have that like insider knowledge of of like um, just etiquette and, and how to act around certain people. Typically, Japanese people don't touch each other. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of uh, foreigners who come in and sort of like put their hands on the yeah, sensei's yeah, shoulders, yeah. and I'm like, Oof. the other thing is like <laughs> visitors to the dojo who um kind of line up in the wrong place or sit in the wrong place when i say the wrong place like i don't think the okinawan sensei is going to be like offended to the core of his being but just looking like oh okay um you're a visitor you, you should you should be over there and you should be doing this that's kind of funny oh and being a kobudo dojo this is advice that i have just in general for anyone who visits a kobudo dojo don't just pick up a random weapon and start playing with it because that probably belongs to someone in the dojo or even in like some dojos they have like antiques that belonged to like Taida Shinken or something like that. And <laughs> I've had people pick up my weapons that are handmade by a Gojiru sensei and by Kinjo sensei himself. We have a lot of people who make weapons in the dojo and they'll critique it. And I'm like, you're looking at the guy who made it. Like, go away. <laughs> yeah, being being quiet is always a good. Mm. Which is something I had to learn the hard way because I'm kind of like a very loud, obnoxious person. <laughs> I, I didn't have a problem. I don't like speaking very much. So. Uh, yeah, I think in Okinawa you don't know it's a problem until it becomes a problem. So there's many times where I've had like a faux pas, and then. Someone like, you know, Miguel or, or someone with kind of like that outsider insider knowledge will be like, Sam, that's not the done thing. Don't do that again. Or like, oh, Sam, you did this the other day and everyone saw it and they thought it was a really good of you to do that. For example, just out of my own personality, um, if someone gives me food or invites me over or if we have a party, I, I always volunteer to wash the dishes. And I didn't know that that was kind of like expected in Okinawan culture for like the youngest member, the, the core high, like the, the lowest rank member, and usually even just the females in the dojo to kind of take those kind of tasks on. Mm -hmm. And so I remember when I first joined Kinjo Dojo and they saw me like just cleaning dishes, 
and and helping around with tasks like that. They were impressed by it. They, they didn't think that foreigners had that intuition to do it. And at the time, I didn't know that I was supposed to be doing that. I was just doing it because that's what I normally do. So finding that kind of like etiquette and like what to do, what not to do, um, I think is really valuable. And I think you should also know that because one dojo does it this way doesn't mean the other dojo does it the same way. Yeah, each dojo has their own separate cultures. Yeah. Yeah, I was quite lucky. Uh, they just told me I'd make a make an error and then they said no do it this way yeah if you made the error again then you would yeah. get in trouble <laughs> that's the thing if someone tells you not to do it don't ever do it again yeah yeah then they, then they'll get angry like, yes in my case uh if i made the same mistake again i would get chastised for it but yeah. if i was just the first time okay i understand you don't know what to do here yeah don't do this mm -hmm. and go, okay and also i think don't be afraid to ask if what the done thing in that dojo is i think most okinawan dojos now have like a, a token foreigner who's always there and they usually know what to do and what the, the culture is like because sometimes as a visitor you'll be like can do i do this should i do this and they just want to be so welcoming to you that they're like ah oh, anything's fine anything's fine just because they say anything's fine doesn't mean yeah. anything's fine everything's Maybe fine finish off by saying mm, what am I gonna say nothing much <laughs> okay well thanks for coming on the podcast and yeah uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime yeah maybe next time I can be a little bit more eloquent in my <laughs> delivery <laughs>